Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of the Inside Track with our sponsors, Fitphone and Independent Gyms. Uh, we've got an amazing guest uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mark, how are you? Yeah, I'm feeling amazing, Ryan. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, a- absolutely. Well, I've been trying to get you on for a little while. Uh, obviously, you're uh, you're the head of uh, Brimham Leisure, so we're, you guys are doing some amazing things up there, so we can't wait to hear all about that uh let's just get glenda on obviously glenda my uh, my uh trusty psychic trusty uh, partner in crime whichever way you want to call it so w- welcome glenda how are you good buddy i'm just really excited about mark being on like you say we've tried to make this happen and i think our uh, listeners will love this so excited to do it yeah Ab- absolutely so the best place for us to start mark and because uh, I can't imagine there's that many people in, in sort of your field that don't know who you are. Uh, you're a bit of a superstar that way. But across the industry, it'd be, it'd be really good because we've got independent gyms that watch us and so on. So do you want to give us a quick insight who who Mark is, what, what your sort of career is, what's brought you to where you are now, and uh, and obviously who you're working for at the minute? Yeah, we will do. And, um, uh, yeah, th- thanks for flattering me there, Ryan. I, I, I do appreciate that. I do actually remember superstars on the telly the days of Kevin Keegan. Yeah, so I, wide, scarily. yeah, I don't I don't look 65, do I? But, you know, I remember those and that. I found that really inspirational on my, as a younger person, my journey to to get active and stay active. Wasn't it Daly like Thompson that used to win them every week? Oh, Daly Thompson and Brian Jacks with the oranges yeah. and doing all the dips. He was a <laughs> legend. I loved it. Yeah, I can still, re- I've got the music in my head now. Da, 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 da. No, <laughs> just, no, I'll have it for the weekend. That's not fair. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, not a superstar in comparison with those guys, but I've always done my best in my job, like I know you two do. And we're in an industry, aren't we, where everybody works really hard. We're all a bit competitive Absolutely. as well. So, you know, we're always pushing the boundaries. It's a great place to work in our sector. But no, to, an- to answer your question about my career and-, and kind of the segue on from superstars, really, always been inspired by sport and physical activity. I had um, I had an idea that I wanted to be a professional athlete, actually a triathlete. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, way back in the early 90s. And uh, so I decided to go to PE college because I thought that would give me loads of time to train. <laughs> um, so I, I very soon found out that I was pretty good at triathlon, but not good enough to make a living. So and then I thought, well, I need a career. So I became a PE teacher. And oh, I've wow. always been I've always been fairly youthful. And I remember when I. Um, when I, I did six years at a PE college, uh, sorry, at six one college teaching PE, and I was about to leave, and uh, the, the the lady in the canteen said to me, "Oh, she said, I'm really pleased you're going. You finally got your A levels. It's taken you six years worth of research." <laughs> she didn't realise I was a teacher. <laughs> that, that's actually a compliment about your youthful skin. To be fair. <laughs> Thanks very much, Glenda. Yeah, yeah, absolutely is. So I went on. I went on from PE teacher to be um, um, uh, a kind of part of the Commonwealth Games in a development role in Manchester, kind of, of the organising team there. And I'd, I, I'd intended to go back into teaching. So I did that major events kind of role, development work as part of a bigger team. Uh, and then I ended up going into sports development because they kept me on at Salford. So I was responsible for a couple of centres, some 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 kind of delivery programs around getting people active this is going into the early kind of noughties uh, and then i kind of fell into leisure in another job i was at school sport partnerships in the days of sue campbell and all that school sport and then i ended up in leisure uh, because I, I was looking at a business uh, improvement program for for for, for, for tameside sports trust at the time ended up becoming chief executive there changing it to active tameside and then since then i've moved on um, um, for a couple of roles. I was at Community Leisure UK, chief executive there for a short stint um, before realising that my passion actually was running leisure organisations. So the job came up in Harrogate. Um, a fantastic vision from the local authority in Harrogate. New model, local authority trading company, which is becoming more popular now as a model. And I think you might want to ask me why that is, but I think there's lots of reasons for that. We'll definitely, we'll definitely come back to that because I think it's a really interesting uh, development over the last uh, couple of years on that one. So we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come is. back on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. But the thing, you know, the job went out at Harrogate and I've been there uh, just over two years now. And it was basically new company looking for a managing director, £40 million investment package. We want it to be about health. So what's not to like? Straight in there, application in. Lucky enough to get the job, 
got the job. Oh, my God, this is a big responsibility <laughs> because the council have got massive aspirations here, you know, and it's a standing start. So great opportunity, but, you know, big weight of responsibility. Yeah. What, what I did find was that the team of people that I'd inherited were absolutely fantastic, all leisure people, well-being people, you know, great track record. Um, so, you know, it's been it's been it's been a, a success story ever since, really. It's still early days for us, though. Did they take the um, so probably talk us through how, how, how that was created then? So did they take the the old sort of ledger? Was that run by a, a separate business? Or was it run by the council? How, how what was it that you took over to make Brimham as, as, as such? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So um, it was an in-house service. You know, you'll, you'll know what I mean by that. But for listeners, yeah. it was run by the council and it yeah. had been run by the council for many, many years. Um, and the council had been working hard to, to, to really get a consensus around an investment package. And then they wanted a delivery vehicle for leisure. And they looked at all the models. You know, they did a leisure review and said, you know, should we, should we put it on the market? And tend to procure a provider mm -hmm. you know and obviously then people like GLL or places yeah. or everyone active would, would have bid they decided not to do that should we set up our own kind of charitable trust or should we set up a, a local authority trading company and they decided to go for that trading company and that's what they did so that is, go on Mark I was just about to ask because you brought it up and I think it's important to actually describe why that is so interesting and um uh, you can tell us a lot more about that in terms of the yeah. trading company. Yeah, thanks, Glenda. I will. I'd be delighted to. And um, I mean, I, I've had experience of other models. So, you know, I've managed two of the trusts which have been independent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and contracted with the council with a formal agreement and, and pretty much been in charge of its own destiny as long as it delivers that council contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the 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 trading company model is slightly different because the council ultimately control the company. They are the shareholder. So the way it works is our board is made up of the majority of council appointed directors. So we've oh. got 11 directors on our board. Six of them are council appointed. Whenever we make a decision at board, we've always got to have the majority of membership uh, from the council to be quorum mm -hmm. to make that decision. And who makes up the other six then, Mark? The other five. Oh, sorry, the other five. five. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, who makes up the other five? I'm assuming, obviously, you. And is, is that then a, a company decision? So it's people that you brought on, so you've got a mix of sort of you and then the council. Is that how it? Yeah, so so with it being a trading company, the council set it up with, with articles of association, which basically yeah. is a governing document to say, right, this is how we want this company, company to yeah. run. So they can vary in terms of the way councils set them up. But before I answer your question, the key rule is called the it, it, it's the kind of tackle law. And that means you can you can you've got to operate at least 80 percent of your business within the geographic boundary of that council. Oh, OK, so you can't go out really yep. and bid on the contracts because anything, you know, anything more than 20 percent, you know, you'd be breaking the law. You can't do that. Yeah. It's very much about running the service for that council in that council geographic area and controlled by the council. So we've got 11, 11 directors, uh, six council, five are company appointed. And of yep. the five company appointed directors, me, managing director. So obviously I'm part of that board and can, can vote and make decisions with that board. Yep. Uh, and I've got a, a business development director and an ops director that are also registered with companies, houses, directors. So that's three. And then we've gone outside to get expertise from outside, you know, volunteers. We don't pay them. Uh, yeah. So we've got two others that we appointed. So they are non-exec directors, yeah? They're non-execs. Yeah. They're non -execs, and yeah. if they came from the sector or if you went a little bit broader, if they came from leisure or are they from other sectors bringing different expertise, what, what what's their... Uh, they're, they're both yeah. passionate about yeah they're both passionate about sport leisure health one yeah. of them is you won't mind me saying is approaching retirement as a leisure leisure consultant okay. you probably know him it's steve laird right yeah yeah so steve started out his career um in sheffield running yeah. ponds forge when it first kicked off and has had quite a kind of um um you know, a varied career as a leisure consultant. So, so, so getting him was a real coup, you know, and, having him board. and he's got a local interest as well. Cause he's, he's not from North Yorkshire, but he's from the Northeast. He's a northerner. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Ryan, sorry, I'm not sure whether you're Midlands or the North, how you classify yourself, but I know Glenda is definitely a Northerner. But, um, but she's, too far, she's too far north. She's past the wall, she is. Uh, yeah, technically, Midlands, Coventry. So, yeah, yeah. I live in the north, so I'm allowed yeah. to... And we've got um, we've got Caroline, who's a who's local to Harrogate, but basically on you know when 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 we got her in, she said, "Look, Mark, I've been a member of every single gym in Harrogate. Um, I'm a trained yoga instructor. I'm an accomplished businesswoman. You know, I'm a director on a board of of, of a kind of uh, surveying firm and everything else. So she's very business minded from outside the sector. But she's but that's what you need sometimes, someone to give yeah. you that uh, guys, why are we doing this?" It's very easy for leisure, leisure people just sit there and go, yeah, this is right, this is what we need to do. And then someone from the outside goes, but why? Well, yeah. I just love that idea, the beginner's mind. You know, Suzuki saying that, you know, get back to beginner's mind and it's amazing what you will learn with a fresh perspective. And I think that's great. I was, I guess, Mark, a question I'd like to ask you is, because you've got so much experience with different models, what's been your experience of it being set up like that? And I guess if you don't mind, like warts and all the good, bad and the ugly, what, how would you describe that in comparison to other models? What's that yeah. allowed you to do? Yeah, it kind of tracks back, I think, to, to you, you asked something previously, didn't you, about why, you know, why, why did the council do this? You know, yeah. and that, that comes down to, you know, well, what's the advantage, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what, 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 um, what happened during, during COVID was obviously there was there was the there was the there had to be a hard discussion between operators and councils about who's going to cover the cost of this. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a contract, we've got staff. You know, you know who's going to cover cover the cost of COVID. You know, because um, uh, we've still got to keep you know these buildings maintained and open and everything yeah. else, even not open uh, operational, even though they're they're closed to yeah. the public. And there was lots of costs there, and um, some councils and operators. Um, you know that that proved to be a too difficult discussion and council said well actually we thought we were transferring the risk here to an external operator um, yeah. but actually when it came down to it we had to underwrite it and pick that risk up so yeah. some but not all made decisions to either bring it back in house terminate those contracts or when the mm-hmm. contract was up, look for other models um and i think that's one of the drivers for the local authority controlled trading company model because yeah. it's owned by the council because they've accepted it, actually it's our risk so we'd like yeah. to control as well yeah. so there's more and more doing it though isn't there mark I, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, i've heard it's um, there was also an issue uh, from what i understand from a tax perspective that there there was a uh, you you might be able to um yeah give more information on this but there's i'm sure it was Harringay council or one of the councils in london took the tax man to court because he was basically saying or they were saying that you're allowing these trusts to get um, the charity status and the taxable benefits that come with that, but yeah. as a council, we can't, yet they're our facilities. Yeah. And so they took HMRC to court and won. And what, yeah. what it gave them then was that ability to then have that taxable benefit and go, well, actually now we don't need that trust. Mm. We, we we can get that. But now I don't know how, how true that was, but I can remember reading an article about it and I thought well, that's going to put the cat among the pigeons, that will, because suddenly now all these councils go, we can control our own destiny again. We don't need the, these big organisations to run it for us. Well, yeah, you, you're absolutely spot on there, Ryan. That's exactly how it is. So there's a there's a tax efficiency benefit now with the trading company, mm-hmm. which which so the council um, might say, well, we want an in-house service. Well, why would they? We can have a trading company that gives us tax benefits, yeah, as well as control. So let's do that. We don't have to, you know, give it away to an external contractor. And, and that and that's what they've done. So that that that's the key advantage, really. Um, the other advantage, I'm sure, Mark, is you just described in Technicolor that everybody's got that huge vested interest in the geography. For a lot of people, it's very personal, and it's all about giving back to the area that meant a lot to them. And I think that that is really important because it's going to drive through the culture of the whole business, surely. Yeah, absolutely. That that local uh, ownership. Um, and passion that you need not only um it helps you understand the community but it gives a passion to make a difference in that community all the fruit of fruitful benefits fall in that community you know that yeah. you're, you're not benefiting a shareholder outside anywhere else or yeah. you know ahead of just in that- London. Well, exactly. I mean, you look at all these uh, big companies, they've got two or three hundred or whatever the sites they're looking after. There's no there's no one going, well, okay, Harrogate needs this. Harrogate's I mean, we all know. 
I mean, I, I, I probably feel it more than most coming from the Midlands up to Yorkshire. It's got its own feel. <laughs> the people of Yorkshire are from Yorkshire. You, you don't find them anywhere else. And so how can you take a London attitude or uh, or from somewhere else and put that into Yorkshire and go, we know what's what's right for this community where you guys can because it's run and developed and, and driven by local people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely true. I mean, you know, you know, in our business that the people we employ usually come from the communities that they serve. Absolutely. So there's something there about those people really buying into a local company as well and that the leadership and governance is coming locally. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I guess I'd love to know, um, because we've seen so much chat and discussion since the recent challenges we've all faced in the sector about, you know, the ongoing challenges. But I just want to flip it a little and ask you what you see as the massive opportunity that's coming. Because, you know, it'd be lovely to think of the hope and optimism first. And I know we have got challenges. And I'd love to hear a wee bit more about that. But what's your thoughts, Mark? What's the big opportunities? Yeah, and um, this this gives me, it's a great question because I can wax lyrical now about something I know you're very passionate about, Glenda, which is kind of health and well-being or wellness. You know, mm -hmm. I'm the same, the same, I know you feel the same way, Ryan. And um, so when we set Brimham's up, as I said, you know, the council said, we want this to be our health and well-being. So I came in and um, worked with the team to produce a strategy. Um, and we've we've called that strategy uh, Revitalise and Reinvent. Mm -hmm. So we're revitalising the stock with the capital investment and revitalising kind of hearts and minds after the big shock of COVID. Yeah. And actually, we're reinventing the offer. And this is the opportunity which which I know you're driving hard and are passionate about, which is about moving from a conventional fitness or leisure operation to mm -hmm. one that's focused on health and well-being or wellness. So where we're, where we're at at the moment in our journey on that, and, and I know that there's others out there doing this and, and, you know, you've got a network and you're talking about this, at, you know, well, not just around the UK. I think I think you're talking about it around the world, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And um, where we're at on it, we're, we're kind of 18 months in to coming up with a new uh, service model. Uh, we've designed that model based on some principles that we want people to start with us. And we want especially people that haven't made a start before to come in. So how do we reach out? We want them to stay with us. So what do we do to help them stay? Well, yeah. what we need to do is is meet them where they are, set, listen to what they want, have a coaching style conversation with them because there might be things that they need that they didn't realize. And yeah. by talking to a professional, having that coaching style conversation, they can do that. So invest in people at the start of their journey and have that really productive conversation because we can set personal goals and realistic goals. And if we're guiding them to deliver those goals successfully, we know that we'll stay and we want to connect them with other people in our community that have got similar interests, similar issues, similar challenges. And then we want people to succeed. And if we've got realistic goals, they will succeed. But we want regular conversations to say how you're getting on. And if you need to change course because the original goals were too high, let's change yeah. course and work with you. Let's not see that as failure. Let's see it as a developmental opportunity. Um, and then let's celebrate your success and lots of creative ways of doing that. So that's the principles. But we're doing it through different pillars as well. So we've stolen the NHS five ways to, to, five ways to yeah. which you'll, you'll be very familiar with. And we've just rebadged that. So we've got a model and we say, look, we're not actually about selling physical activity. We're about selling lifestyle. Yeah. And we don't sell gym memberships. We sell relationships. And we want you to have a relationship with us and people in your tribe, in our community, yeah. because we want you to stay with us through those principles. Mm -hmm. well, we've got movement as the core or what we're calling a keystone habit, because that's our core offer. Yeah. Let's get you involved and let's be active. Glenda, if you're like me, Ryan, if you're like me, you know that if I'm active, then I'm more likely to eat better. I'm more likely to have structure to my day, which makes my mindset better. I can go and do it with other people, which is helps in my connection. And if I'm doing the right kind of activity for me, not overdoing it, not underdoing it, I know that I'm going to have less aches and pains, uh, you know, and I'm going to recover quicker and all those kind of things. So our, our model, if you like, is movement. It's about nutrition. It's about mindset. It's about recovery. It's about connecting with self and the community. And that's what it is. So we're designing the model around that. The big challenge for me and the team, and the team are great because they're doing all the work on this and they've got all the ideas. 
but we've got to have this ready and launched for July. So, um, so this is where we are. It won't be perfect then, but it'll be work in progress. And that's what we're talking about. I guess the nice thing is, though, Mark, I, I was going to say maybe it's been a negative that you've not had your sites open so you can sort of go from idea straight to launch. But I guess in a nice way, if you flip that the other way, you sort of, you've not had these operational issues. Because quite, quite often what happens is you try and develop something new, but you're still dealing with the crap. <laughs> the, the club's open and you're developing that. So it takes longer. And then you end up putting little bits and taking tiny little steps. You guys have got an amazing opportunity because you, you're spending loads of money on developing these fantastic new sites. But they're, in essence, locked up. So you're yeah. creating all these great things to go, okay, we train all the staff, we get all this ready, we go into pre-sale and we sell our dream. And I think I think that's an amazing thing to be able to do and in terms of taking a project right from the ground and going, it's almost well, it is brand new, but you've not you've not had the headaches of trying to run a club run these sites and try to bring in your new vision. You basically parked the sites and gone, right, let's create the vision. And now we're going to just dump that in there or or get it in place, get it ready, get everyone fired up. And, and, and it will be a massive super change when, when you open rather than trying to create a change of culture that's already there. You're sort of creating the culture from the outset, which is exciting. It's exactly like that. Yeah. So in many ways, um, we've got a period of time to get this right. And when we turn the key and open the front door on those two new sites we've got, you know, we'll be ready and we can get a great pre-sale. And you use the word sale, Ryan. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to pick up on that for a second. Because, you know, I did say before, you know, we're, we're selling behavior change, we're selling relationships, but there has to be a pride tag, tag to what we offer. You know, we can't offer it free, even though the council we work with wants to change lives in the community. Yeah. So we are non-profit, which is similar to the charitable trust. We want to make money in some areas and cross subsidize elsewhere because we are socially entrepreneurial. But, but we are we are have a clear mandate for the council to reduce the cost of operation. You know, the council are not throwing money at this without a return. Yeah. They, to, they expect to return on health improvement in the community, which ultimately will have a reduction in cost as health and social care. Absolutely. Just quickly on that one, Mark, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to you a bit. Just quickly, how, how are you guys measuring that? So that... that uh, I was going to ask that question. It's a fascinating one. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's a brilliant thing to say. This is a the council won't return on that, but how do you measure that? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, we are working that through at the moment. Okay, you know, so that we've got valid and reliable measurement. Mm -hmm. If we were having this conversation five years ago, we really would be struggling. But now, as you know, there are tools out there quite yeah. well developed digital tools you can do this and we've got moving moving communities for example you know so there's lots of social return on investment models that we can use and we can mine our, 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 our data our participation data we can reference that against postcode and, and where people start and, and how where incredible will it be able to have that information to go look this Absolutely. is what we've invested these are the programs that we're delivering this is our return and this is what because then it doesn't become a brimham thing then it becomes a, a more national thing to go, guys, you run your project like this and these are the genuine returns or the values that come, come back to us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. absolutely. What, I what, think, what, sorry, go for it, Mark. I'll ask you in a minute. All right. But just very quickly, I think, you know, the, the, the measurement needs not just to be about how much active you get in people, you know, which is a quant easily quantifiable output, isn't it? Well, it came so many yeah. times in the exercise, so many minutes. Yeah. It's actually what is the impact that that physical activity is having on that community and the individuals around Absolutely. the different domains, and p particularly mental health is a key one. So, you know, mental health... Um, well, that, that does mental. interest me a huge amount yeah. because... And I want to just be a little bit challenging because I know, Mark, you're the guy that will rise to that. Like, you will put us in our place, which we like. But sometimes the intention is good in our sector to do more than uh, fitness. And we have made massive claims in the past yeah. about uh, the wellbeing agenda, as in, you know, we are really good at impacting people's psychological health. We socially connect people and it goes on. And did they really do that? Not convinced at times that we did. And I think we missed a trick, which is why I'm super excited. And 
I guess my question there is threefold, really, and sorry if I'm barreling it up here, but um, I'd be really fascinated to understand why you guys absolutely wanted to go for that drive to wellness because, as I've said to Ryan, it isn't for everybody to do that, even if they're passionate about it, because I think if you don't, if you just say, well, we just do fitness and you stay in your lane and you're very transparent about what you do, there's a case for that as well. So you've deliberately went for wellness. I'm fascinated to know what got that over the line as the strategy. And what is that actually going to look like other than just the physical? Because I know it does absolutely where movement goes, energy flows, and that could be social energy, psychological energy. But on the ground, operationally, what will that look like other than just the physical that we'd expect? Yeah, thanks. There's a lot in that question, Glenda. So if I go off track a bit, bring me back on with a supplement. Yeah, that, how, how we have it of doing that sometimes where I sneak a couple in. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. And um, I, what I also know is that this is kind of, these, these are kind of, um, you know, concepts that you've probably been mulling over your whole, whole of your career and you've studied it as well. So, um, but um yeah, I think in a nutshell for me, it's important for me personally because it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. If I was selling a gym membership, then, you know, forget it. I'm not interested, you know. And actually, you know, the path of least resistance is to get a nice new building, fill it with lovely gym equipment, yeah. um, lovely, nice kind of, um, you know, promotion around a great group X program totally. and all that get a great pre-sale, get a great marketing plan and smash it. And people will come in their thousands to a new pool, to a new gym yeah. and say, look, aren't we fantastic? Great. And that's fine if that's a business model. And you can probably do that at a minimum cost because the asset sells itself. Yeah. You know, providing you maintain it over the time. And there's lots of nice gadgets and apps that people can have and just say, look, you know, go for your life, get on with it. Have a great time. That's brilliant. You know, and we'll get we've got some good instructors here and we, we don't pay them very much, but they love the job. You yeah. know, and when they want to go on and get a mortgage and stuff, we know they're probably going to leave the sector because mm -hmm. they can't afford to do that job that they love on the pay that they've got. So we're not about that. What, what we're about is saying, yeah, we've got this lovely asset. We've got the shiny kit. We've got everything else. But we know our community partners. We're going to meet you where we are. We're going to look at these other domains. That's what Harrogate Borough Council wanted. But and here's the but and here's the challenge that I think where you were going for. I know that my client hasn't got an endless pot of money and they're going to say to me, Mark, first up, have you balanced the books? Yes. Right. Now talk to me about health and well-being. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but that's the hard truth. That is the harsh reality. Yeah. Economic Absolutely. Climate. But I was just going to give you a quick but, and the but is that our business model is built around, not around sales, it's built around, as you'll be familiar with, and this is your bread and butter, I know, Ryan, retention yeah absolutely how do you get retention you build the relationship how do you build the relationship with substance you deliver what they want and people want health and well-being now they don't just want physical activity well program. look i just i was too i didn't want to put my uh thoughts before i heard yours but we're yeah. so on the same page because yeah. what you're if i'm hearing you right mark there's so many drivers there isn't there it's mm. like we know that that's what people now want yeah. because people understand that they don't need to run a marathon, but they want to feel better about yeah. themselves and yeah. be generally healthy. Um, the second one that I think is really important there is um, we haven't done an amazing job of retention and we have got attrition issues. And yeah. I think it will be an amazing case study to look at a site like yours who have gone into that uh, journey towards fully integrated wellness and see it, what your numbers would look like in comparison to a similar demographic size price. It's, isn't it scary, Glenda, when, when you think that uh, as an industry, we accept 50 to 65 percent attrition numbers and think i think that's just well that, that's what it is well, I, I just i was i was really Amazing. fascinated by the drivers because and i get it when i've i've listened to mark in other interviews and what comes through strongly for me is about uh engagement connection and actually losing inequality here because 
the thing that really gets my go about wellness is the people that tended to do all the lovely wellness stuff were always the people that could afford it as well. Mm. And, you know, there is serious inequality when it comes to health, even more than fitness. Mm. Like, you will be more healthy just by your postcode, you know, and that's because of loads of different factors that make that up. And I think that I just get so excited to hear what your drivers are. And I think, Mark, if I'm hearing you right, it's not just about you being a leisure provider. You want to get people more cohesive in the community. And I honestly think that since the pandemic, we've lost a lot of that even more. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and I think the uh, I think the, the, the other key point here is that when we go out, to uh, let's say when we talk to health and social care, we know that that's an overstretched system, more overstretched now than it's ever been. And actually, it does. You know, what's co what's coming through for that for that for that system is not good either, because we know we've got demand increasing, aging population, you know, yeah. rising health inequalities, people living for longer with more long term health conditions, less younger people paying into 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 the system so a burden on the pension pot and less money so how that translates into local government is local government's got less money as well but it needs to resolve the the, the health and social care issues at a local level yeah. so it's a balance between what we can invest to generate a long term benefit for that community so as a managing director and the other people that you've had on the podcast like Andy King for example who's yeah. doing great work in GM Active with other colleagues there, we've got to be great and highly skilled um, negotiators with other stakeholders to say, look, Absolutely. we're non-profit. We need an investment to operate these assets. We want to reach out in the community, engage the people that are already engaged. We want to address health inequalities, but we need to do that such a way where we can create a business model that's sustainable and yeah. we can map out the future benefits to the health and social care system and we convince you that those benefits are going to drop in your garden. I actually That's think, Mark... Key conversation. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think what's exciting here as well is if we're all open to collaboration, and I know you do huge amounts of that with the people, uh, guys like Andy King and your other colleagues that you network with, but locally, I think there's got to be a much bigger collaboration between what you do and what, for example, public health does, because they, yeah. they are very complementary. And I think that that support will come closer together. I think the thing that makes me nervy, and I just wanted to see what you would think, is I know that well-being scares a lot of people because it's inherently very complex. Behavioural change is complex. It's multifaceted, way more than fitness. Fitness is one dimension that we've pretty much, we understand it now, and we're not always amazing at it either. How do you think we take the wellbeing agenda when it is multifaceted and so complicated? How do we do that justice? What's the sector going to need to do it well? What do you think, you know, what's needed to do that job? You know, is it going to be education? Is it going to be working with external agencies what do you think that will look like i think there's a classic kind of uh, human psychological trait there and that is you know as human beings we're very confident in knowing what we know we <laughs> yeah don't, we don't know what we don't know yeah exactly yeah and and um and i was really fortunate coming into coming into harrogate and helping the council set this company up because uh, at the start there was three community hubs which were very much well-being focused. And I've got a, a lead health and well-being manager called Joe Bogan, if you're watching. Hi, Joe. Hi, um, Joe. And We've Joe, met Joe before. Yeah. So Joe did, Joe, Joe has done work for many, many years uh, prior to me arriving uh, to develop that health and well-being approach in those community hubs, which is a, a small sports hall, some meeting rooms, kitchens, you know, in some of the more deprived areas of the Harrogate area. And then we've got leisure. So when they set the company up, the idea was to bring all that together. So we've got the expertise coming from Joe in her team to, to kind of infiltrate that standard leisure offer and harmonize it and take the best of both and create this new well-being. Yeah. So Joe and her team have got a great track record in the models that you'll be well familiar with, Glenda. And I think some yeah. of the things that you're referring to around the 12-week window of behavior change, the classic period 
you yeah. know, and all the other elements. So Joe and a team are having very rich conversations with our duty managers and the other sites, with all the teams there saying, right, this is what you thought you knew, but you didn't. In the yeah, most sensible brilliant. way. So, so there's going to be a lot of education, plan. right? You know, yeah. and a lot of upskilling. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of upskilling. And, you know, what we want to do is create uh, career jobs and opportunities for people here. So we want those passionate, you know, people that have come into the industry and show provide well-paid jobs with a career pathway. And that's really refreshing, Mark, because our industry our industry's collapsed when it's come to that. I think yeah. what, what's what's happened is people have come in. I mean, I, I did – obviously, I went Jimmy Strutter PT – up to management and sales and, and 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 then through GM and so on, but that doesn't happen anymore. Quite often, what happens is they come in as a, even if they come in as a gym instructor, they're quite quickly forced into freelance PT, and yeah. all all this other stuff that our industry used to do 15, 20 years ago yeah. is lost. Trying to find, I mean, I do it quite a lot now. Trying to find really good general managers. One because there's a lot more facilities around, so yeah. sharing the expertise is a lot harder. But trying to find really good staff now. Uh, yeah. at that senior level with the experience like yourself coming through and whatever i mean you, you've obviously done it all the way from p to but all the way through in terms of various roles that, that just doesn't exist now and it's so difficult to, to to find that so i think any company like yours that's doing that and bringing them through paying them well so they want to stay but it isn't all about pay it's about development and growth and, and everything else and i think if you're doing what you're doing and bringing people through you're going to have such an amazing pipeline to then take it further yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's spot on. And, you know, and, and there's never been a better time or a, or more of a need than there is now because of the recruitment challenges we've got. And I've got two teenage boys, you know, at the moment, I'm not going to advise them to go and get a job in leisure. And the fact of the matter is they both love to because they're passionate about sport and physical activity. What are you doing about that, Mark? What are you doing in your business that's going to tackle that? Are you guys bigger pairs or...? What, what, what's the thought process there? Because you've mentioned that a few times now, and I'm just curious to, you know, how, you know, with your expertise, how could as a sector we make it more attractive? Because we know it's not just down to the pay, right? But it is partly a challenge. Yeah, I'm going to deal with the pay first, if that's okay, Glenda. Yeah, go for it. And, that, and, and actually, um, it's going to come with a challenge to the sector, you know, and I'm going to be pretty brutal about this. Yeah, let's do it. But, we love that. But, yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we've we got a sector at the moment where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing in terms of national strategy and policy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's too many agencies at the national level. We don't know who's representing leisure for a start. Yeah. You know, who, where's the big voice? Where's yeah. the coherent, clear message about what we do? And And we know it's not working because... You know, we we haven't got any support, and we're not we're not uh, classed as essential in terms of yeah. you know support for energy costs at the moment. You know, over Absolutely. over kind of museums, you know, for example. You know, and we had a similar problem going through COVID. So, well, that one comes back to the fact, Mark. Let just touching on those because I'm quite vocal on that as well, as you've probably seen. But I uh, I generally think we spend more time going with our begging bowl and saying yeah. we are we are we are rather yeah. than actually proving we are. Yeah. And making them invest because yeah. I think if you carry on going, we need VAT discounts, please. We need we need money on our energy costs, please. And that's all we're doing. But we don't actually prove to anybody out there, like you say, we've got too many organisations. You can actually seems by I'll name them: Sport England, all all these different, but. They sort of work again, they sort of don't. UK Active is a membership organization. It's not the industry body like everybody else out there thinks it is. So if you're not a member, they don't, they're not there for you. So they don't represent all of us. They don't, they, they, it is a close, don't get me wrong, they do do some great stuff. I'm not, I'm not dissing them completely, but they're not there, they're not our industry representatives, neither a Sim Spa, neither a Sporting. And it, it's sort of going, well, who does represent, like you're saying, who does represent all of us? And who's who's there to then drive us forward? And and at the minute, we're not essential. We're not seen as essential. It's quite clear the government don't see us as any part of their plans as regarding improving health and everything else. And whilst we carry on as we are, we'll get the same results. We've been asking these same questions about VAT and all this stuff ever since I joined the industry, which is 25 years ago, and it was the FIA. Nothing's changed in 25 years. Okay, the people have and whatever, but the actual structure of the organisations haven't actually improved 
anything for our industry in terms of what we get and, and the, the links between us and government and everything else. Yeah, from a pub or a hospitality or that sort of stuff, happy days, I can get all sorts of support and help. Uh, but we're clearly not getting the message across. Uh, and unless... I don't know how you change that, though, Mark. Maybe, maybe that's a longer discussion. But We've talked not... a lot about this with Dave Monkhouse, uh, John, Andy. Data insights have got to be critical in our sector to show the difference that we make. And that's why I want to keep flipping this to the positive. I'm so excited for the work that Mark and his team are doing because if they get data that can show us this is how you retain people, this is how you improve your attrition, and actually on all these health measures, this is the impact we have at our local level. That would be mega exciting. Well, I want Mark to say to me three years from now, Glenda, the strategy that we use has increased life satisfaction in this part of our country by 2%. That would be something that, that would make me want to read more. How did, how did that happen? You know, we can do some basic well-being measures that actually show the difference we make, but we don't do that very well. Yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, so, I interrupted you on the staffing thing, Mark. In terms of obviously, yeah, let's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ryan, I've lost me. I've lost me thread now. I've got. I've got. Um, oh, sorry, that's the, that's early, my fault. Early onset of amnesia. No, I haven't. I can go back to that, and I'll come back to the data one. But coming back to the first question about um, how we're going to do it, and and I said I wanted yeah. to deal with pay first, and I started to talk about you know the national institutions. What I want to say is, that in terms of the national institutions, we've got great people. There's some great people. They really are passionate and everything else. But it's, um, it's an organisational dynamic and it cuts across every national institution, not just sport and leisure, all government, you know, and yeah. quangos and everything else. They, you know, they begin to take a mind of their own and they look at growth of their organisation before they look at, you know, what they're delivering outside of that. That's just a fact and that's no slight on anybody. So I think a rationalisation of our institutions and a more coherent and a clear strategy and a voice, because you're right, Ryan, I'm with you. You know, I've been involved equally as long and this hasn't changed over time and the other thing that hasn't really changed significantly is how many more people were getting active so you know what we're all failing you know well, we're doing the same thing expecting a different result yeah. aren't we yeah absolutely classic einstein so 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 <laughs> i i i fund my fundamental where i am and i you know i'm I've, I've kind of developed the way i lead people and and all that kind of stuff and really you know, my journey started inside out, understanding myself before I can understand other people, you know, all the kind of leadership books and stuff like that, but genuinely living like that. And I think what I realized was that, you know what, it doesn't matter what you want to do unless you've got the right people in the right places with the right conditions, you ain't going to do anything. So you can write whatever strategy you like, you can do whatever you like. It is not going to happen. It is all about the people. What do people need? They need they need a secure job. They need a reasonable level of pay. They need to be looked after. They need to be developed. And actually, Mega. I'm we, that with you. Yeah. So and we're already ahead of the start line in this industry because everybody that comes in is super passionate. They yeah. love it. We're the ones that put them off. They start <laughs> absolutely on it. You know what I mean? They start to succeed and then we talk them out of it. So where I was really, really fortunate in this job, really fortunate, is colleagues at Harrogate Borough Council said, we're going to invest, we're going to get the building sorted, and you know what, we're going to set this company up, and here's the point, but we're going to put you all on council terms and conditions. Wow. And we want a commitment that you will stay on council terms and conditions. So I am not out there, like a lot of other providers now, yeah. with minimum wage, you know, poor T's and C's, poor pensions and all yeah. that kind of stuff. I can go out there and say, great pension, great holidays. We're looking after you. Staff wellbeing programs, you know, career opportunities. We're throwing loads of money at education, Glenda, around this wellbeing model. So, you know, I can create the conditions to succeed because I've got the right conditions Love for the that. people. Where do so I apply? Can... Pardon? <laughs> I said, where do I apply? And can I, can I just put a bit of challenge in here as well and, and track this back to my point about the national institutions? Yeah. So, you know, when when the consultants go out there, and I know, I, love a lot, I know a lot of consultants and great respect for them, they do a great job, but the council will say, a lot of council will say, how can you, how can you deliver a sustainable model here as cheap as possible? Yeah. We need to stop treating leisure like a commodity. 
yeah is a vehicle to have an impact on communities absolutely to change the lives I mean, of if, communities. We, if we get it right and I, you you said that earlier mark the money that we save the challenge we've got is we've always and i'm getting a wee bit further in towards the public health arena here but we've yeah. always had that medical model which is a total deficit model because yeah. we are now all about prevention right yeah. and that's a hard thing because like what you guys are doing is investing in the front end to save money at the other end which yeah. i'm like i love this i think the thing is the savings it. won't come to mark that's the interesting thing about all this model the savings that mark makes by making people fit healthy and everything in the community will come from the nhs so in 10 years time Harrogate NHS and round there, hopefully, will be saving millions because the people are fitter, healthier, obviously uh, le less problems in, in society. So in terms of that, if it goes really well, they'll be saving money. But you as a as an operator will probably never see any of those savings because they'll well, be coming it, from another part of the community. And other KPIs, you know, like we talked about retention and attrition, et cetera. But and I, I'm sure the books will be healthier as a result, right? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? That Mark does all the hard work. And I, and I guess that sometimes is why we have this challenge with leisure and government, because they don't see that link. And, and also, you, you have to have a look after time. Anything we do now will have an impact potentially 10, 15 years time. So when I'm Rishi Sunak and I'm looking at uh, giving leisure some money to, to drive it forward and, and whatever, I'm going, I'm not in power in 15 years. It doesn't. It won't impact me. It won't impact me at the next election. Why would I do it? Whereas things like pubs and restaurants, hospitality, it's, it's almost an instant thing. So they can they can make nice moves and uh, and and get the get the sound bites out there. And I guess that's always the challenge. They'd rather pump money into the NHS because news wise, it's worthy. Ten billion more for the NHS rather than going ten billion for leisure because that's going to save us fifty billion or whatever it is in 10 or 15 years time and that that is our biggest quandary here is it's sort of going how do we create our value because ultimately if we get it right you'll be retiring when you really see the the, the, the you know what i mean i know you'll see some great stuff over the next 10 years mark i'm not saying it, you won't but if it all works out how you want it to you'll be retiring just as all this great stuff actually starts showing in the well, community. That's a, that's a legacy piece, isn't it, for yeah, Mark? I, 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 absolutely. So but what Mark's describing, which is a huge takeaway for the listeners, I think, is he, without even saying the word, it's about that culture of well-being in the environment. And mm -hmm. it's the, I love the fact that you've mentioned people, Mark, because we, need, we can uh, pour from an empty cup and I think yeah. our sector's been doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Yeah. It, relying on goodwill. And I think it's incredible that you guys see that. I think that culturally, um, environment for the people that are going to do that job, if they feel that they've got more than just that basic survival, that we ought, you know, food, shelter, and when you've got these guys into that really high end of Maslow's needs where they feel fulfilled, that's going to yeah. just end up with an experience for the customer yeah it will it translates and i think i think i'm, I'm glad you said that glenda and um you know w you know there's a lot of public unrest out there in in a lot of sectors you know the nhs um you know uh the rail workers you know quite rightly coming out saying look you know our pay's been eroded we, we you know but we're not doing that in leisure and maybe we should but because leisure's not an easy job. It sounds easy. I work in leisure, but I yeah. work shifts. It's custom yeah. facing. It's really busy. There's massive footfall in buildings. Things go wrong. You know, people in leisure centres have to deal with first response to cardiac arrest. That's not yeah. unusual. You know, there's a big responsibility around drowning and injury prevention, you know, and, and all the other things that come with being a customer facing. So it's not an easy job. And our, our people don't get paid enough for what they do. They don't get recognised enough for what they do. It's an, it, So it is all about the people and looking after the people. I remember when we interviewed uh, Pete Webb, and uh, I don't really know Pete, but Pete does a lot of work in, in wellness and mindset and whatever. Yeah. And the one thing he, he made uh, a big point of is we change people's lives. Yeah. And so when, when people look at the value of what we offer and everything else, a lot of the customers will see it's because it's their leisure. They see it as easy. 
it, yeah. they, they, so I, I don't know why, but they make that link between, oh, it's 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 my leisure time, so it must be an easy job. You're like going, mm, it's not quite how it works. But he was saying the impact we have and what we always always have to remember is we have the ability to change people's lives, and I, and I, and I think we do. I, I think it's uh, there's a lot of people whether they lose weight and increase their confidence, whether their their diabetes gets reduced heavily because of what we do. Uh, they, they they obviously come back from massive injuries, hip operations, stuff. You know, I mean, we change people's lives, and I, and I think people need to understand that, and we should be paid accordingly. But I think with the with a lot, and, and not to knock the budgets because they've obviously they they have their place in in our industry. But I think with with the fact that they've come in and eroded the price point and everything else, I think it's had a massive impact. And I think strangely, COVID sort of flipped that on its head because it's created this wellness and uh, and uh, mindfulness that people want now they want small support and i think it's able to then drive the st sort of stuff that you guys are doing um when i think the industry was pretty quickly going the wrong way in terms of no no staff in the clubs no support no and, and people using apps to do everything and that's the wrong way for our industry to go yes there's a place for it but that's not what our industry is about our industry is about helping people helping people be healthier fitter uh, and, and and more well so we're uh, so absolutely so what you guys are doing is brilliant i won't take up too much more of your time one thing i would like to ask unless glenn has got anything else is in terms of inspiration i mean obviously you've talked about how you like to lead and and it, it comes across massively in terms of, of how you how you do things Mark. And uh, thank you people should take inspiration from that and how to lead people it is about uh having the right team and so on but who inspires you so other than your family and we, we 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 try and take family out of this because it's uh, everybody has a family uh, family connection, but you can have that if you want. But generally, who who inspires you to do what you do? Who's who's made you do what or helped you and and it kept you going on on the right track? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And um, I know you had a previous con uh, podcast with Andy King on it, and Andy and obviously Andy and I know each other pretty well. And he yeah. said, "Oh, you know, um, Mark's really inspired me. That was a real yeah. shock to me, you know." Yeah, he did. Well, you yeah. can't have Andy. You're not allowed to yeah. have. You can't, you can't, no, you can't what, build each other's what, ego. Yeah, I know. And um, so that was great coming from Andy. You know, with, with the guy he is, it was great. But I do have to tell you that when I wanted to be a professional athlete, remember I said at the beginning. Yeah. Andy King came to me one day because I knew him. We went to the same uh, PE college together. He did sports science. I did PE. Oh, and, okay. uh, and he says, "Mark, I've got you some sponsorship with Perzo Cycles." That is the kind of guy he is, right? Without, you know, I'm going to go and get some sponsorship for Mark, and he did it. So he was already an entrepreneur back then. He had a great business mind. He'd go out and make connections in the network, and he did that. So I've got to tell you that anecdote of Andy, it was amazing. That's fantastic. You know, and, um, yeah, fantastic. But the person that's really inspired me the most, and I said this before, so when I was in that role as working on that new uh, program of school sport partnerships, um, uh, You'll know, you'll know uh, Baroness Sue Campbell. Mm -hmm. You know, she, so, so Baroness Sue Campbell was a PE teacher. Um, yeah. she, she went on to set up uh, the Youth Sport Trust yeah. and banged Tony Blair's door down, demanded a load of money, got the best part of um, £10 billion, pounds, you know, over, over the course of 10 years around the school sport partnership, transformed yeah. PE in school sport. So when people talk about how do you influence in government and, what, and about the national leadership, nobody is better than her. I found her really inspirational, cut through all the politics to get what she wants, literally camped out of you know the minister's doors to get that. Then what did she do? She went on and led UK sport and got the, got the medal hall in 2012. Wasn't 2012 an amazing year? Oh, it was incredible. 2012. I still, I still think back to the Danny Boyle yeah. NHS part and the opening Amazing. ceremony. So, so Sue Campbell was behind that medal hall with the way she restructured UK sport and the funding yeah. into elite sport. And then what have we got then? Women's Euros, Euro champion. Who's behind that? Sue Campbell. Yeah. So she's inspirational because she delivers in a complex political environment. She delivers and she speaks truth to power. We need more of that. We need more. I mean, all the politicians I work, some people, you know, people get scared. of. They're all genuine people and they want the best for their communities. They want the challenge. They want to know how it is. But the amount of people I've seen, you know, in local government and that just pander around politicians, the human beings just tell them how it is. They want the best. Yeah. I think Sue, Sue Campbell has modelled that and she's got results. So I love her. I think she's great. Well, Mark, you've got a lot in common with her in my book because what showed up for me today in an absolute richness for me is that you do that 
you know, you're very much professional with amazing integrity, but you will say what you want to say. And I think we should be hearing a lot more of what you've got to say because it's inspiring. And I'm uh, very much inspired, and I want to say it on record, that you could have took the easy option and you've decided to go on a journey that is inherently challenging but will be so unbelievably impactful. And um, I, I just take my hat off to you and I want to thank you for pushing that agenda because... I think that our sectors needed it for a long time and we need someone to shine the light on and have a torch that we can look at and go, well, if they can do it, so can you. And I think that's the point, that. isn't it? Someone needs to prove the model. Yeah. And it, you know what I mean? So if, if you can prove that model, because the thing is, it's, it's all right doing it in a, in a ledger trust and stuff like that. But what we need to do, we need to get the private ones to go look at you guys and go, do you know what? That can work. That's actually financially viable because a lot of them were looking to go, well, let's just stick to fitness. Let's just stick to because I can make my like you said earlier, we can get a nice, nice club with shiny kits, sell some memberships, bang it out, make some profit. But what we need to do is get these guys to start looking at it and going, actually, look, look what those guys are doing at Harrogate. They've, they've got this wellness model that's integrated. It's got all this great stuff. So this is what they do. And guess what? They make profit. <laughs> They actually make money. Um, and I know you're right. profit, Mark, Mark said it earlier, it doesn't that, that's not proved to go as any further towards up in that magic figure that everybody keeps talking about that's never raised in 20 odd years. We're not going to push that dial any further because there's only a certain percentage of people in any population that are ready to sweat like crazy uh, and start with fitness. It might be that they start with something that resembles just really, really informal exercise, or it could even be non-exercise, and it could be something in the well-being um, arena that then gets them interested in exercise. Absolutely. So I think the key is we could probably speak to you for another hour, Mark, because there's so much stuff. So <laughs> we will definitely get you on again. And I think what we'll do is we'll get you on again and maybe even we'll come and do it at your one of your sites. I think that'd be quite, quite, once you're open and it's all running, we'll bring the, uh, we'll bring the kit and we'll, we'll, we'll come, come and do it on site in Harriet. Cause I think that'd be a really, really nice thing to do and show off what, what, what you guys have done. If I can just say, I would absolutely love that and welcome that. So book us in for after September and we can do it on site and talk about the new offer. That would be awesome. And I know we're going to speak be you know, between now and then. And we've got lots of other things to talk about offline. And can I just say thank you both for the opportunity. And also what you just said there, uh, Ryan and Glenda, um, gives me a lot of reassurance because I know you know the scale of the challenge that and, and what it must be like, you know, it, it, to be yeah. somebody that said, right, we're going to transfer, we're going to convert this model. It's yeah. it's not going to be easy. We're not going to get it all right. But we're good. We, but you know what I mean? You you said, Glenda, you've said, actually, Mark, 10 out of 10 for having a go. You know what I mean? We're right behind and Hey, you. by the way, if I'm going to put my money on any horse, it's definitely you, Mark, oh, thanks, because absolutely. you've got inspired leadership. And um, I actually think with, uh, starting with culture and environment, you then get inertia, and I know you're going to get that, and it'll be with huge amounts of will that uh, I think your team are going to be behind you in that mission, so thank you, and uh, we wish you the very best of luck, and we're excited for all of you. I think uh, amazing to hear what you're doing, and thank you. Amazing. Absolutely. What what we will do, uh, obviously, as always, to, to our listeners, if anyone does want to reach out to Mark, you can find him on LinkedIn. Uh, he's he's uh, quite active on LinkedIn, yeah. and uh, and we'll put obviously any of the links to uh, to Boom and Leisure and so on at the end, so people can reach out there. But really appreciate your time today, Mark. Uh, obviously, we will catch you over the next few weeks anyway. But uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming on, and uh, we will see you soon. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Glenda. Bye bye. Thank Take you, care. Mark. Thank you.